Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here for our event with uh, Johnny Sun to celebrate his uh, his new book, Goodbye Again, Essays, Reflections, and Illustrations. Uh, he's in conversation tonight with Min Jin Lee, author of uh, Pachinko. My name is Evan Karp. I'm the events manager for Booksmith. We are an independent bookstore and mainstay of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury District since 1976. Min Jin Lee is a recipient of fiction fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study at Harvard, and the New York Foundation for the Arts. She's the author of the novels Free Food for Millionaires and Pachinko, a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction and a New York Times 10 Best Books. An international bestseller, Pachinko is translated into over 35 languages. Her writings have appeared in The New Yorker, NPR Selected Shorts, The New York Review of Books, The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, The New York Times Book Review, The Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian, Times of London, Food and Wine, Vogue, and The Wall Street Journal. She's developing Free Food for Millionaires for Netflix with Alan Yang. Lee was named as an Adweek Creative 100 for being one of the 10 writers and editors who are changing the national conversation and a Frederick Douglass 200. She is a writer in residence at Amherst College and serves as a trustee of PEN America and a director of the Authors Guild. She's currently at work on Name Recognition, a memoir of visibility and voice, and is researching and writing her third novel, American Hagwon, uh, which will complete the Koreans trilogy. And Johnny Sun is the best-selling author and illustrator of Everyone's an Alien When You're an Alien Too, and the illustrator of Good Morning, Good Night by Lin-Manuel Miranda. He was a writer for the Emmy-nominated sixth season of the Netflix original series, BoJack Horseman. His work has appeared in The New Yorker and McSweeney's. Time Magazine named him one of the 25 most influential people on the internet, and his TED Talk on loneliness has been viewed online more than 3.5 million times. As a doctoral candidate at MIT and a creative researcher at the Harvard Metal Lab, he studies virtual place and online community. He received his master's degree in architecture from Yale and his bachelor's degree in engineering from the University of Toronto. His new book, as you all know, is Goodbye Again, Essays, Reflections, and Illustrations, which is, is just out, and the reason uh, for our gathering here tonight. Um, thank you all so much for being here, uh, Johnny. Um, uh, congratulations on the book, um, and, and, and Min, um, thank you for leading the conversation. It's uh, delightful to um, have you both back here with us, and um, I'm very excited to stop talking and turn it over to y'all. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Evan, for that generous introduction. And I'm so happy to be here with Johnny. Hey, man, how are you? Hey, man, how are you? I'm, I'm doing Congratulations. good. Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> it's always so nice when you see a book and you're like, oh, my God, it's done. It's here. You know, it's real. It, it like exists in the world. I know, because it was, it's, it's been with you for such a long time, right? Yeah, uh, three three years. Um, I think I started formally working on it at the beginning of 2018, um, but I think it it has been in my head like before that, and it's kind of bounced around as like series of notes and like uh, amorphous sort of cloud of like, what is this? Is this anything? Um, for for quite a number of years before that too. Right. No, I think it's such an interesting book in so many ways. And I was thinking about what you're trying to do. And it's essentially a kind of a distillation of philosophy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think that's really what it is. And I think that I was trying to figure out what are the analogs that I could think of. And I thought maybe this could be kind of like the prophet for the millennials and Gen Z, you know, like Khalil Gibran, Johnny Sun is the new, I mean, it has this kind of because what you're doing is you are telling us about what existence is and your take on it and and about the reversal. Like, mm -hmm. I thought this was really interesting in terms of your structure. You're obviously an artist and you understand design. And I thought you must have had a very clear intention of the design of the book. And it's in five parts. So you ha it starts out with goodbye, go slow, take care, hello, and then hello again. However, it's titled goodbye again, right? So, and I was thinking about every <laughs> single thing and I thought about the movement that occurs in these sections. So I was hoping that tonight that Johnny would read us snippets of his very short takes, but the, the short takes are short in terms of economy, but like a poem, they're incredibly large in terms of their ideas. So 
Tonight, we get the treasure of having Johnny read to us a little bit. And then afterwards, we'll discuss each thing and sort of unpack them. And I get to ask Johnny a lot of nosy questions. And he's going to start us out with nostalgia. Yes. Thank you, man. Thank you for that lovely, um, for those lovely words about the book. If, if I can, like, just say real quick. I, no, I'll, I'll read the thing first. I'll do my job. I'll do the thing that I'm, I'm supposed to do. And then, and then we'll talk about, about the book. Uh, all right. So uh, this piece is called, called On Nostalgia. It's uh, page 30 to 31, if anyone has the book with them. Um, and I'll start reading. On Nostalgia. I have a certain nostalgia for happy moments from years and years ago that I do not remember feeling happy during. Perhaps happiness flees so quickly after it visits that I forget that it even visited at all. So I'm just left remembering happy moments as times when I should have been happy, forgetting that I actually did feel happy, but it came and left so quickly that it was as if it didn't come in the first place. Or perhaps what's closer to the truth is that I didn't feel happy in those moments at all. Instead, what I can only seem to remember is the anxiety and worry that I felt during those moments. The happiness comes much later. It is what comes now, years and years after, when I convince myself that I can finally, safely feel happy about these moments because all these moments and all these worries and anxieties did not seem to bear any fruit. The good thing that was really happening didn't fall to pieces or get taken away from me or get crossed out by something I did or something bad happening the following day or the following month or in the following years. The memory is still standing. The good thing still really happened. And enough time has passed to be safe to say, yes, you would have been justified in feeling happy at that moment. And that feels pretty close to having a memory of actually feeling happy back then. It feels pretty close because it is to look back and try to reassure myself now that it's over and it's happened, it's safe to finally feel the happiness you wanted to feel about it. Now you can feel happy because now your happiness will not get in the way, will not change the outcome. It cannot ruin it somehow in the way that you think happiness might because it's already happened, it's locked away in the past. The memory has finally hardened into stone. So this nostalgia is what, an echo of happiness or a long delayed one? Is it an outline of one from trying to remember a happiness I knew I should have felt in the moment, but that most likely wasn't there? Or maybe nostalgia is to feel a happiness about something that is over because it is over. That in order to feel happy about it, it must be something that you can't go back to and affect, that you can't mess up from where you are now but also that you can't really feel at all. Wow, wow. So we have the word nostalgia, right? So the root of it is nostos uh, and about home and homesickness and a wistful yearning for this lost condition. And I think that one of the things you're talking about is this happiness, this ideal perfect thing. Mm -hmm. And I wanna ask you, like, do you think it exists? Like amidst the noisiness and the crowded mind and the anxiety and not, not knowing of, what this really means and the floating like right now in this tiny little moment when all of us are here together yeah like is it happiness like are we going to remember this moment with happiness are we going to feel the worry about oh gosh like will the technology falter or you know what does johnny <laughs> think of me or is my hair you know not combed right <laughs> like we, we have all these noises and at the same time what would make us really pay attention? Because I think, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to say pay attention, give attention, because that's one of the yeah. criticisms yeah. that you actually yeah. talk about in your book, right? So what can we do to give our attention and to receive what we're supposed to? So what do you think the lesson is in that essay? Yeah, that's a good um, point. I think like a lot of it, um, a lot of I think like my process with the book was trying to was trying to think about um, like memory and sort of the effect of memory and um, sort of like grappling with the idea of like of what it means to sort of live in um, the past or live in something that feels like you can't access in the moment. Um, what are you so missing? That, what are you what missing, I, Johnny? Yeah, right I mean, here you are, a nice boy from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And where are you right now, by the way? Where are you? I'm in L.A. Uh, in, okay. we're, oh. we're stuck in the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you're in the West Coast. You're oh. from Canada. You've been yeah. you're you're educated mostly on the East Coast mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of your graduate education. Right. Uh, in yeah. dismal New yeah. Haven yeah. and get in dismal Cambridge. And here you are in sunny L.A. <laughs> 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 Doing all sorts of security things like what do you what do you think home is for you? What do you, what are you yearning for? Like, what is that state of home? 
Yeah, I think like that is the, that's the question I don't have that I tried to figure out in the book and I still couldn't. I think like part of it is, I think a big part of it is just like um, the home or the happiness in other people and in sort of like the connections that I've um, felt or been able to find with other people. I think like to go to your question of like, how do we, what, like, what, how do I feel right now? I feel mostly happy. I like, I'm excited to talk to you. Um, I've felt mainly happy about like all the virtual book events because I've I kind of like sneakily used them just as an excuse to like talk to people I admire and so it's really cool that like um, there's also an essay in the book that I talk about like having like friends through work that like working on something together feels um, easier to me than sort of having like an unstructured sort of like hangout time because what does that mean um, but like I kind of really love the structure of like this conversation because okay we know we have an hour we know we're sort of going to talk about a specific thing we have like these guidelines and then within that we can kind of fill it um with with ourselves and with each other and like with that like with whatever the conversation and connection becomes and I think like when I think about home or when I think about kind of like moments of joy in my life I think a lot of them come from like a connection or a presence with someone else or um or like with uh, like a specific type of connection with myself because I also feel like I'm not always connecting with myself as a person either if that makes you know sense. I want to talk about that specific point because oh. I think that you've made yourself really vulnerable in your work and that's one of the hallmarks of a Johnny Sun piece of writing or art is that he expresses his vulnerability and his intellectual curiosity and and the sense of wonder it's it's one of the loveliest things about your work is a sense of wonder and awe at the at the greatness and also at the the darkness of human condition. I mean, I think that you're doing it, but in a very approachable way. So we're kind of going like, you know, we kind of gingerly approach these hard, <laughs> hard questions because behind sometimes some of these really friendly things, you're going like, ooh, that's about death. <laughs> 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 that's what Johnny's talking about. Did you see that? Did you see how he did that? <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you in terms of, the thing that I really see, and I was wondering what you wanted to fess up on, is I think you have a real sense of resistance. Like you are resistance, you're resisting the dark. You are resisting the things that are pulling us into a sense of meaninglessness. Because the thing that I see over and over again is you are knocking on the door of where is meaning? Where is meaning? Mm -hmm. And 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 that's the reason why I thought this book is really about. Uh, your philosophy about life. So tell me what's going on with uh, Layover, which is uh, the next piece I'd love to hear you read. Okay, let's let's do this. Um, all right, so Layover is, um, it's kind of like, it's part, it's in the early, in the first half of the book. And thank you for like, for um, kind of recognizing the structure of it, because I wanted the first half of the book to feel more um, sort of like knotted, like more kind of tangled and, um, mm -hmm and more difficult and then I sort of wanted like it to feel like the knots are loosening in the second half of the book as like I tried to like think my way around some of these things um, but layover I think feels like pretty close to like the, uh, the like one of the emotional like kind of climaxes of kind of like this particular um, negative feeling um, or if not negative feeling just this kind of particular feeling around like um, liminality and about um Kind of like the pressure to be productive and its relationship to also uh, in contrast to on nostalgia this piece mm -hmm. is much more rooted in a space and time yes yeah right it's much more dramatic it's much more fictional it, it, it actually you, you said the scene mm -hmm. so let's hear it okay <laughs> um, all right layover I'm currently riding in an airport, not because I'm waiting for a flight, not because I'm waiting for someone to land, but because I just got off a plane and I'm in this new city I've moved to and I have nowhere else to really be. I don't know many people here and I've been subletting someone else's room for the last three months and that means I'm living in someone else's space. So it doesn't feel comfortable to me to really start to head over there because I don't see it as a home. So I'm forcing a layover with no flight to catch next so I can stay here as long as I want. There is a sense of comfort here in the airport, precisely because you're not supposed to stay at an airport. The airport is not a destination. You're supposed to spend as little time in an airport as possible. 
I'm very familiar with this feeling that I'm not really welcome in a place. And this is a coldness that airports are at least open about. Airports make everyone feel like a passer through, like a visitor, like an outsider. And this is comforting in its honesty because aren't we always, always just visitors, just passer throughs? Most other places try to convince you that you're more than that, but airports don't dress it up. Because airports make you feel like you're always passing through, it also allows you to feel cut off from the world. While I'm here, I feel actively unreachable, protected by the fact that I'm still in transit, still arriving, instead of simply being in the city and having no one in the city who would want to reach me. Here, I don't have to worry about feeling alone for a few moments longer. Feeling lonely is for people who have arrived somewhere, I tell myself, not for people still on the way there. Wow, wow. So you have this young person. I mean, I'm, I shouldn't say young, but you have this person who is renting a place in mm -hmm. a city that's not necessarily a place of his origin. And then he's actually chooses to be at the airport and that's mm -hmm. where he's finding work. And yeah. he's also aware that he is passing through and therefore, since he's only passing through, he might as well be at a place of transit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I wanted to ask you, um, this sort of reminds me a lot of your work as Jomni's son, as this uh, Yeah. Right? right who's also visiting this kind friendly visitor exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i wanted to ask you is that the is that your alternate person mm. your persona is that your avatar is that your is that your is that your i guess your closest understanding of yourself still or do you feel like that was somebody who was younger because that is a prior work yeah I, that's a great question i think like I, I do feel there's that there's often a sense of like um, like liminalness in like my own I think my own self and my own identity and kind of how I navigate life that I mean I think part of that is informed by the fact that I spent the last like I spent about a decade of my life um, in college and then in like grad school and I it's it's interesting being in that kind of mental space because those are spaces that you're not supposed to stay in. Like it's built into the fact that you're supposed to like spend a few years here and then go somewhere else. Like they are um, by definition, transitional spaces, I think. And um, so I think that has kind of informed my own kind of opinion and view of myself. Um, and then I also just think that like, I don't feel very at home in most places anyway and so like right. I feel even if there are kind of homes to be found or like places to kind of settle um I feel I feel very anxious in general about that and so it, it feels like I'm constantly kind of moving in between things um but can we talk uh, about that can we talk about the yeah. sense of being ill at ease or the lack of ease. And then even this whole notion of disease, right? So, yeah. and because I definitely understand that, but for me, my understanding, I used to think it's because I was female, because I was an immigrant, because I had a name that seems foreign. I thought it's because I'm a person of color. Yeah. I thought it's because I was progressive. I thought it was because I was raised as a Christian. Like there are all these things. And I kind of thought in my mind, my nostos, like my, my yearning was like, oh, I'm going to find my people one day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> one day I'm going to find my community. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, I know if I hang out with feminists, if I hang out with artists, if I hang out with people of color, and then I'm 52 years old and I realized, no, it's actually just me. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just the fact that I will always feel the sense of unease. And yet I will have these momentary moments of connection. And I was just curious like, for you, is it identity is it gender? Is it sexuality? Is it class? Or is it the ontological Johnny Sun? I think it's I think it's a combination of a lot of um, those things. I think like I thought about that too a lot of like where is like anytime I feel like there is a potential space to belong for me. There's it's easy for me to like sort of um, internalize or like spot the things that make me different from like, mm. from what I assume, from what I assume or what like, from maybe the box that I put a certain kind of space of belonging into um, where I think a lot of it has to do with um, 
gender in a way, and I think masculinity specifically, where I've never felt at ease or at um, any sort of comfort around like any sort of traditional sense of manliness or, or masculinity. I've never, it's never spoken to me. And so I think like a lot of those spaces and kind of the ways that men interact with each other has, I've always been like, I hate this. <laughs> like, I, I don't enjoy this at all. Um, and then I think there is like, I think there is like an element of, um, of race. I think, I think there's an element of um, kind of just like all the, and I, I, there's also an element just, I think of like, um, like interest and of sort of this idea that, I mean, I've, I'm constantly aware, I think of how I may be seen by other people or like this, like this constant awareness of like, oh, how are other people gonna like flatten me into like a one-liner to be easier to, to understand, which I think is also like a, a, a person of color kind of mentality or something that's ingrained in, in us in the sense of like, anytime I enter a space, it's some, I have a feeling that like someone's gonna like try to fit me in their box or like some sort of bias that they have of me. And so I think there's like that question of if I'm to try to move beyond that sort of flattening and move beyond that sort of box that I may be seen as, there's an element of like, oh, well, then there's no like place that like the fullness of, of myself can exist in a way. Um, yeah, but I absolutely. Think, yeah. Does that make, do you feel that? Well, I was going to just, um, since it's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, I thought I would just drop some Mencius on us. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, Mencius, who is now known as Confucius in the Analects, one of the things that it's, it's a list, it's a litany of what is a gentleman and gentleman being the highest state of development for a human being. Mm -hmm. And he says, a gentleman is not a vessel. Okay. And I remember thinking, like, what does that mean? He's on a vessel. You know, I was I read I read this when I was like 19 or something. And then I thought about it and I thought about it. And then I read some kind of um, treatment of what this really means. And essentially what Confucius actually meant was that we're not meant to be fitting into this or a larger thing. We're actually infinite. Mm. And that as you become more evolved as a human being, that we shouldn't be contained in a thing. So in a way, our resistance and our rebellion against it, a label or a box or a container is about our moral development, our character development, our intellectual artistic development. So I always thought, oh, that's really interesting. Like, I don't agree with everything about Confucianism, but I definitely agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of like going back to what you're saying is that when we re so all those labels are useful, yeah, but it's yeah. not all we are. So like I remember thinking, mm -hmm. oh, if I meet um, a creative, feminist, progressive, Asian American woman, <laughs> she'll be my <laughs> she'll be my affirming mirror, and we'll be best friends forever. <laughs> And then, right. yeah. and then at some point I did meet women like that and they're really fantastic but I realized like oh we're kind of different like mm -hmm. our affect could be different like I could be goofier and that person could be much more sober or mm -hmm. in like I'm more laboratory retriever and they're much more rottweiler so <laughs> anyway um the next thing that I'd love to hear you read is this is really interesting this goes because kind of goes to the next part about po politics because I think that you are critiquing politics in your work here and that's your essay escape so oh, i was yeah. wondering if you read that to us oh, which yeah. is right next to layover yeah which actually in the book comes right after it which um is is cool because i think in all the readings i've done i haven't actually done like a run or like anything that is right next to the other thing so um i like this is this is a great selection um because because it's it is speaking directly to to layover and that idea of like liminality um, okay, so this is called, this one's called Escape. I had a dream where I was staring at one of the walls of the room I was subletting when I noticed a crack in the wall, right between where the bed is and where the desk is. And I went up to the crack and I picked at it and I picked at it and it slowly opened up into a hole. I found myself walking through the hole only to, to discover that I did not end up standing in the apartment next door, but that I was inside an impossibly long, expansive hallway with no doors or windows along its sides and with no way to enter or exit it, except for this crack in the wall that I had opened up. 
it felt like I had accidentally discovered this space backstage to the real world that I was that was never meant to be seen. I walked down this hallway for what felt like hours, trying to get to the end of it until I realized it had no end, at which point I turned around and climbed back out of the hole. And when I was back and safe in the room I was subletting, I discovered that no time had passed at all. I tried not to enter this hallway, this magic impossible space where time didn't pass for any reason. It felt wrong, but in times of stress, it began to feel like the only solution to my problems. I'd go into it and use it to get some work done when I was facing an unmeetable deadline and when I needed more time than I felt like I had. When I went back from it into the world again, it was still the same time as it was when I entered it, only now all my work was finished and I had so much time left in the day to do whatever I wanted. I finally had free time. But now that I had this hallway available to me, I realized I could use it to get more and more work done. And so I brought more work in, having all the time I could ever need to do it. And every time I came back out into the world, having completed all my work, I found less and less joy in having all this time out my newly free time to live, to connect with people I wanted to know better, to see the world with less guilt. I just used my time outside to hunt for and gather more work, to accumulate it, knowing that I could bring it into my hallway and get it all done and do more. And that became the only thing that felt like it was worth doing in the outside world. Soon this hallway held more and more of me. I filled it with things and furniture that helped me get my work done more comfortably. And one day I brought in enough work to fill an entire life with. And one day I just didn't come back out. And the part of this that made it a dream was that no one noticed because in the outside world, no time was passing at all. Wow. So you have this sort of Kafka-esque you know, Johnny <laughs> Sun allegory of work. You have a dream. And I was curious, I wanted to know, what is work for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I still don't really know. I think like part of it is. Um, you have a lot of it. Yeah, I mean. It's I a high class problem, it. but you have, because a lot of people want things from you they they expect things from you you must have a reputation of being able to deliver because people don't ask unless they can expect something good right, right. but you have yeah. a lot of work and what what is your relationship to it do you like it do you dislike it is it like something out of control at this point yeah it feels like it's it I mean at the point of this it felt very much like it was out of control and I think doing the book also made it feel more so because it was such I mean like books are such daunting kind of projects to take on um, but there is like that element of it. There's a. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only person who thinks books are hard. You... <laughs> no, 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 no. All the writers are like, "What's Johnny talking about?" It is our <laughs> 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 Um, But I think there is like a there's a there's a, a a strange thrill to it, right? Like for for me, there's. Um, I mean, I think what I've started to realize. And I don't like I, I also wrote this book with the with the goal of not having any answers in it because I feel like I don't have any answers, but I'd rather like kind of present questions. Um, but one thing I realized is that I tend to like assign my own like personal value to the work that I do. And if people if people like the work that I do or if the work has value, then that means I'm valuable. Like that is sort of my personal contract with um, like my own like product productivity and so I think there's that element of that where like I still sort of have this ingrained thinking of like the more I do the more I'm worth like existing the more I am worth being known to somebody else or the more that I like I'm justifying my time here and that's a really slippery tricky slope because um, I think the the start of that thought process is the idea that like I don't have value for myself as like someone who just exists that like right if I start from that idea I need to create value. that's scary and and uh like personally demeaning right um well so. I think that you're being critical of capitalism you say so in several places of what capitalism requires of us especially I think in terms of a 21st century neoliberal capital order where we yeah. have a winner take all culture, right? So we have this demand for productivity and ceaseless productivity. And right. then you have this young thinking sensitive person in this book who's saying rest, attention, slowing down, growth, existing for its own sake, 
beauty for its own sake, knowing for its own sake, you have this real intellectual person and a mind that's resisting the demands. And that resistance is what I'm seeing in all mm. of these essays. And I was just curious, do you think that it's possible to have work without it becoming your master, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really, I'm not, I don't know. I think I'm trying to get to that point, but I also like wonder if there's, yeah, I, I like, I, I think, well, I think there's one of the things that I think I've tried to like reorient myself to is this idea that um, like the, like, I think creative work specifically or any sort of work um, that sort of is in service of like connecting uh, to other people or is in service of sort of like creating a relationship um, feels a little better. But I also just wonder about like this idea that like just the, the concept of work being so ingrained in our lives that we can't even imagine what it would be like to not have work, right? Like to even I think like for, for the idea of like, oh, like I have to work on my relationship with people or like my, like so-and-so requires like work and attention. Um, I kind of wonder like how it, it's once, once I start thinking about like how deep the rabbit hole of like um, work goes in, in terms of like my own head and my own heart and like how um, like the societal pressure of work has impacted me, I start to like kind of get scared because I think uh, there's like, there's a great, there's a great tweet. <laughs> this I'm going to cite a tweet, uh, but there is a great tweet that, that kind of goes like, um, uh, I don't have a dream job because in my wildest dreams, I don't, I don't like, I don't imagine work. Right. Like there's, there's something of that, of like, even like when, when I start to think of like how I'm built and how I kind of imagine my space as like a, a, a vessel for, for making or for product. Um, my question is like, I, I don't even know how to like see outside of that. And I think that's really scary. That like when, once I imagine like a world where I don't work, I'm not really sure what that looks like or how that exists because I, I don't think that's something that is presented as like a possible thing in our kind of society right now. And yet there are so many people who don't have work or they don't have meaningful work and they don't feel a sense of liberation from work. And so when we think about if work is tied to personal value, but if you don't have work, does that mean you don't have value? And I definitely think that one of the things that is interesting to me about this collection of thoughts that are so important is, well, if you want to make things, one of the most important things is a sense of play. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you see that in your other works, it's like the sense of play, the sense of wonder, because without that sense of play and wonder, then it's impossible to make new things. And I definitely saw that in your egg recipes, you're being mm. playful about these recipes because you have to read the recipes fairly carefully to say, oh, it's about his family or it's about memory and it's about what we make of something as simple as you know this you know, this very simple egg and it's yeah. very important that it's an egg right because it's about birth and <laughs> all of that's in there and it's because i think you allowed yourself to play with these things and it and i believe that this book really came out of not just struggle but also out of play mm -hmm. and i want to respect that uh would you please share with us my grandfather's plant oh sure yeah um let's do that one all right um Okay, my grandfather's plants. When I was born, my parents were both graduate students. I was a little kid when my mom got her PhD and I remember going to her ceremony. It was in an enormous gymnasium or maybe it felt like a gymnasium to me at the time. And I remember sitting in the bleachers. Again, I don't actually remember if these were bleachers or if this was just an extension of my imagining that the ceremony took place in a gym uh, with my parents. My, or with my grandparents, with my brother and my dad. And my dad turned to me and my brother and said, when your mom's name gets called up there and she goes on stage, I want you to, I want you two to cheer as loud as you can for her. And when my mom got on stage to accept her degree, we stood up and cheered and made all the noise that we could. 
after the ceremony, after the bleachers in the gymnasium were put away, again, assuming we actually sat in bleachers and the ceremony actually took place in a gymnasium, we met my mom at the foot of the stage where the organizers had started stacking the folding chairs and removing the Velcro curtains around the edge of the stage and piling together all these long tangly vines and these cheap little plastic planters that they had brought in for the purposes of making the gymnasium look prettier for the ceremony, again, if it was a gymnasium at all. My grandfather said, they're gonna throw away these plants anyway, so why don't we take one of them to remember this day by? And he didn't ask anyone and he just took one as we left. That plant, that long tangly vine lived in my grandparents' house and it grew and grew and reached its way down the bookshelf it sat on top of and across the window frame next to it and up around the light fixture hanging from the ceiling, growing in all directions with the house holding it up, providing the structure it needed as it grew. Even, af even after my grandfather passed away and the garden and all the vegetables in the backyard stopped growing, that one vine still grew, still stayed watered, still stayed taken care of, still survived. And every time we visited grandma's house, it was still there, holding on to more and more of the house each time. It felt like my grandfather in a way wasn't completely gone. Sometimes a plant is just a plant, but sometimes caring for a plant feels like some way to do something when you don't know what else to do. Sometimes caring for a plant feels like a way to remember someone, a way to in some way, continue caring for them. Sometimes you keep caring for the plant and the plant keeps growing, discovering new corners to inhabit, new walls to climb. Years later, my grandma moved out of that house and into a small apartment in a senior's community. We visit her as much as we possibly can, but now I can't remember if the vine moved with her too. Yeah, so there's this real undercurrent of growth plus nostalgia and also, the loss, loss. Mm -hmm. And of course, you recording that memory, you recording that plant even. And also because your grandfather took, I mean, I was thinking in my mind that plant is more or less a symbol of your mother's PhD. <laughs> <laughs> because that plant is so tied to her achievement of you uh, cheering and the and your and your grandfather saying oh this is our time when we're supposed to give recognition to your mother so it's a very important moment in your family history and then we have this plant which the grandfather actually tends to the plant in a way that he can't tend to his child anymore and then it's gone and yeah, yet yeah. you remembered it and you've recorded it and now it's permanently in this book yeah, there yeah. is a volume of this in the library of congress now <laughs> 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 the plant lives <laughs> <laughs> at least in our recollection. And I wanted to ask you, like, what, for you, what is the plant as a metaphor throughout this? I mean, I obviously have ideas of it, but what do you think, what do you want us to have? That's a really good, um, I think like for this specific, um, for this specific essay, um, the grandfather one, um, I think part of it is, it's funny, I actually didn't, you, I think, blew my mind just saying that because I've always assumed, I've always associated that plant with my grandfather. I always thought like, oh, this plant represents my grandfather and my grandma like continued to take care of it um, after he passed as a way to remember him. But I'm realizing now that I was using the plant as a way for me to remember him. Um, but in reality for him, it, it might've been closer to the fact that it, it was to remember my mom and, and her achievement, right? Um, I didn't, think of that and now I feel very silly for not no 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 actually because <laughs> no no actually I don't think it's silly at all I think that for me I have a child mm -hmm. so there have been moments when I've been with my son when he's done something and I'm so pleased and I'm delighted it could be very something very simple like a like a birthday party invitation and maybe it means nothing to him but it means something to me because it reminds me of him so when I keep memorabilia of my son it's mm -hmm. not about so, and, and taking care of it is about my love for my son in the same way your grandfather loved his daughter mm -hmm. and then also his wife loved him. Does that make sense? So it's actually, it's all the love that's connected. It really depends on how you see it. So right. I don't think you're silly at all. Yeah, thank you. I, like, I, I think that's like part of what's exciting about, well, about that essay as like a small thing is sort of about also the imperfection of, of memory and the sort mm. of imperfection of, um, the one thing that I really wanted to do, the book is like, there are a lot of drawings um, of like most of the plant 
essays in the book are illustrated, right? I'm, I'm not showing you, I'm showing like the, the people, uh, but the, that specific essay about my grandfather's plant is, is not um, illustrated because I wanted to evoke that emotion and that feeling of like, oh, there's, there's um, the reader can't see this plant because I can't fully see it, you know? And so I, I wanted that to feel a bit imperfect. Um, but then I think throughout the book, there is this idea of, um, I think there's a, an idea in, within the plants and within kind of the book of like trying to grow. And a lot of the essays of the plants are about like the plants dying and not being able to continue to grow. And so I think there's like that idea of resistance that you talk about is also um, part of part of the book of, of using the symbol that should be of growth and should be of like, um, something that feels natural, but instead not being able to to summon that or not being able to sort of sustain that. And um, I think throughout the book, there's like different versions of that struggle or that resistance. Um, but I think that was that's one of the things I wanted to kind of revisit and use use kind of strategically throughout the book to sort of um, kind of like thematically tie the essays that kind of appear around. Well. I thought that the plant the serves as a as a very rich allegory for Everybody. us and about our lives and also about your art. So, um, I want I'm really enjoying talking to you, but I want to be fair to the audience and they have these questions. So do you mind if I read them to you? So, oh, this is great. Yeah, absolutely. Can you see it? So do you want to shout out? I absolutely do not mind. I'm sorry. Hi, Kayla. So oh, Kayla. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so Kayla's like, is the plant in Johnny's background the same one from the um, book cover, the back cover? Ah, um, it is. Uh, it, it's not. It's um, it's one that the one that I drew here um, was uh, based on the plant that I had in Cambridge when I started writing, and um, this was a, this was a pothos, and then the plant back here is actually a uh, Hartley Philodendron, which is a slightly different type of plant. Um, but but one of the sort of like illustrator -y secrets that I had in drawing this was that I also referenced the philodendron plants in kind of getting the leaves. Um, so this is kind of like a, a cross between a pothos and a philodendron, even though it's supposed to just be a pothos, um, mainly because I wanted to make sure that these leaves kind of really uh, resembled hearts. And I wanted that to be like a subtle sort of uh, symbolism across the cover. That's awesome. So Skylar Saunders, building blocks, the quote, quote, building blocks blew my mind and felt so relatable. Have you thought more about that concept since finishing the book? Have you come to think of any solution possibly to that way of imagining ourselves and our past current work? So for, first, can you please explain building blocks for those who don't know, and then to explain Skylar's question? Totally. Um, yeah. So building blocks in the essay kind of comes uh, again in like the first half of the book that sort of more wrestles more closely with um, with like productivity and the idea of work and value and kind of identity based around it. Um, and I use the metaphor of like Tetris um, being a, a kind of like paradoxical game in the sense that like when you watch the blocks fall down on the screen, you kind of assume that you're building a wall. But every time you fill a, a layer or a row in Tetris, it disappears. There's like, it's like an endless task. You can never actually build this perfect wall unless um, the, your like job, the task you do is imperfect, unless you have holes in the wall. Um, and they kind of, that, that's how I feel about work a lot of the time in the sense that like once the project is complete or once you hand it in, um, I keep expecting it to sort of stay with me and like help identify me to myself, but it doesn't. That it feels like as soon as it's done, it's it's gone, and suddenly I'm like lost and facing a blank screen again. Um, and so the 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 really the the question I think that comes with it: um, Have I thought more about it since finishing the book? Um, do I have any solution possibly to that way of imagining ourselves in our past slash current work? Um, I don't. I feel like I'm still wrestling with it. I thought by writing that essay, I would have more of a way to deal with it. And I think what that did is it, it, it gave me more of a language for like how I, how I feel about this thing. But I don't 
think by writing it and getting out of getting it out of me that I've like expelled it from I think it's it's helped me describe it a little bit better and so like for example I already like this book's been out for like two weeks and I already feel like I'm talking about somebody else's book I feel like I'm like defending someone else's thesis um, whenever I talk about it uh, which is it's which is a very strange um, feeling that it, it's sort of hard to um, for me to like identify with 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 my past work I don't I mean do you feel that way about your work like how do you kind of relate and identify well I think what was interesting about what you just said it's really it's really interesting to me to hear it because you're grappling with several themes in this in this book mm -hmm. and you provide these sketches and they're very beautiful because they are finished sketches and they're finished works of art but it's it, it is true what you're saying is that you are raising these questions there they become almost kind of like these sort of Cohen's they have this kind of you have this question what do you do so is it like Tetris is it like etch a sketch you finish the drawing and then all of a sudden it's it's you know a brand new screen right. again <laughs> I mean that's an, that's an old-fashioned screen for those of you who don't know what an etch a sketch is <laughs> I wonder if everybody knows what an etch a sketch is did you ever have one I did. I feel like there's probably an app for it now. Right. <laughs> um, which is so sad because I remember like you, you have this and you shake and you have this brand new thing again and it's kind of, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. It feels actually very environmentally, eco, you know, eco right. and everything. I also, um, I learned about like Cartesian coordinates through an extra, extra sketch because it like moves in into right. right? <laughs> exactly. So anyway, I am really interested in, in what is what is it that we do when we make art? So I think it's Freud who has some version of this idea that what is um, not spoken and not heard becomes acted out. So the reason why therapy is so important is that in, the, uh, in our exchanging and our expression of our anxieties, our troubles, our heartbreaks, our griefs, our lamentations, what we're doing in our anger is we are expressing what we're feeling and therefore we will not act out. We will not do things that are destructive. I think that artists and writers have always tried to express it in our, yeah. our artwork, right? And that's part of what we're doing. Part of it is actually quite therapeutic. But um, is it conclusive? I don't know. Like I once heard Ishiguro talk about how each book for him is, is, is this exactly the same field that he's always working on. He's like, I have found my field. I have found my turf. This is my turf. <laughs> and, but he goes, but it's actually the same thing. He goes, every one of my books is really about the same thing that I'm working on. So I don't think, he, I think he was saying he hasn't quite figured everything out. Right. Part of the writing is the figuring out. Part of it is the struggle that maybe it's a better struggle. It's a better dramatization. I mean, maybe novels and essays are just our, you know, fourth grade dioramas in a shoebox. Yeah. Right. I mean, I feel like there is like that level of like, it's a constant, I think all works of art are sort of like a constant translation. It's, and I think they're always imperfect. I don't know if there's like a such thing as like a perfect translation between like what someone, what, what that feeling is and like that, that product, I, or at least for me, it always feels like a slightly imperfect translation, but, um, and I think, I don't know if this is different um, for like across different kind of creative modes, but at least I think when in my writing, when I'm writing like ostensibly about myself or like some version of myself, um, my goal is to try to be as, as accurate as possible to like both the, the, the struggles and the questions that I, I'm trying to deal with that like, I don't think it's, or it feels false to me to try to like present the solutions if I don't have them. And so I'd, I'd rather like accurately mark down the questions. And that that sort of feels like that, like um, that Freudian thing you're talking about of like uh, of like saying it or speaking it in some way um, to mm -hmm. describe it. Uh, but, but yeah. Well, I think it takes real courage and clarity of conviction to raise a question because sometimes what we have is all this chaos, right? And before you can get to the cosmos, you have to find the questions. <laughs> and that's not easy. And especially one of the things is that you're a, a creature of the internet and so am I. Uh -huh. We have to try to manage what we make of the internet. 
And I know that you've actually talked quite a lot about this in your famous TED talk as well. We are all raising our questions, mm -hmm. right? And we are all trying to say, this is important. Please pay attention to this or please give attention to this. I would love to give attention to more questions. We have a very little bit of time, but I want to get to uh, Laura. I want to say Pena, I think. Maybe the Enya is missing. I'm not sure. Forgive me, Lara. It's Lara. Are there people that inspired any of the essays, but they don't know, like a silent Ooh. inspiration in a sense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, I, you can answer Lara's question. <laughs> that's perfect, Lara. Um, I, most of the people who I wrote about in the book, I reached out to um, and said, like, is it, can you read this? Are you like, okay with it? Even though like most, I, I barely name anyone because I wanted it to sort of feel um so again, like a, a bit imperfect that like I wanted it to feel like the memory wasn't fully clear. Um, but most of the people I, I wrote about, I like got them to read the piece. There were a few people who like I haven't spoken to in many years, um, in like a decade that I did not reach out to. And I don't know if they would know that they are the ones being talked about in the book because I don't mention them by name. And they kind of appear as like a, in one sentence of something um, that I haven't, uh, that I, that, so, so the answer to your question is yes, there are people that inspired some of the essays, but they don't know. Um, I think, I think there's also an element where beyond like the, the like literal sense of like referencing like a friend from high school and like his, his idea of like what it means to be a regular at a restaurant. Um, there's also like a feeling type thing. And I think that's sort of inspired by many people and like many writers that I, um, that I read and that who I know um, who they, they don't know it because I've never like told them like you, you and your sense of humor or your type of um, the way you like talk about things kind of has inspired the way that I do. So um, yeah, there are, there are plenty of silent inspirations in, in the book. Let's do one more question if we can. Is, uh, Julia asks, your last 15 minutes before the end of the world rang from worst to best is just amazing. What was the inspiration behind this piece? How did it come about? It's actually a very beautiful essay, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Manon, thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, the, for anyone who doesn't know, who hasn't read this piece yet, um, yeah, it's called Your Last 15 Minutes Before the End of the World, ranked from best to worst. It is written as a listicle, so it goes from 15 to 14 um, to 13 and so on. And um, the inspiration for that is, I think a lot of kind of like the, a lot of the genesis of like the pieces in the book come from almost like, a, oh, wouldn't it be funny? Like, wouldn't it be really like either joyful or playful, like you say, man, or um, kind of like delightful to try to, to try to write something with this idea. And I think like that comes from, that piece specifically comes from the idea of like, well, I know that like everyone hates listicles and like they're, they're like commonly derided. So my thought was like, wouldn't it be funny to make like, a very like emotional listicle, to make one that argues for the format of the listicle that like we can, the current form online for the most part is derided, but can we take that form and is it possible to sort of write something that 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 makes it feel not derided? That makes it feel a little more um, personal and literary and um, and uh, and like booky in a way. Um, but I think that that kind of that mentality kind of applies to a lot of the things in the book. Like even with plants or like eggs, um, there's I think there's a constant. For me, there's a constant search of like, I don't know how to talk about the big problems like directly. The best I can do is kind of find the really indirect ways to sort of address those big questions. And one of the ways I like to do that is by taking something that feels very like everyday or very small, or very kind of overlooked and pay like really deep attention to that and try to say like, oh, a a an egg is like a fun, to me, an egg is a very funny object that like I would, I would love to like explore um, the egg in terms of like its relationship to myself and my memory and like inheritance and stuff um, and potential and, um, and birth and um, to really kind of like explore every kind of facet of it. Um, 
that was kind of a long winded, winded answer. But. No, actually, you know, it's very funny when I was thinking about your last 15 minutes at that listicle slash poem slash essay, there's a very tragic comic quality to it. And it reminded me of all the moments in my life, like in, 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 in light of mass shootings, yeah. in light of like I was in Japan during the Toka earthquake, or I was present in uh, downtown during 9-11. Like there are all these moments when you kind of think, oh, will this be my last 15 minutes? So then I think your deep consideration of what would you do and at the same time, you're trying to add humor to it because it's too, it's too much <laughs> for yeah, anyone to really right. handle. And I thought that, that you handled it quite well. And I think that it was, it was approachable and yet it had the necessary level of pathos in it. Uh, I believe Evans is coming back on, but there's one tiny question. And I think that maybe you might be able to answer it from Kayla in your essay about friendship. You write about how you're not sure if your relationships with others are enough or not. Do you feel like COVID and everything being online and asynchronous has changed how you feel about friendship and casual relationships? Hmm. Yeah, I um. That's it's that's a really hard one. I like I feel like the kind of I, I read an essay, I think there was an essay recently, I don't remember where it was published, but about this idea that like we've lost because of the lockdown and because like we don't have like our everyday interactions anymore, we've lost um the very important sort of like casual friendships, like the the water cooler friends or the people at work that you just kind of say hi to and make small talk with, like that is gone. Um but I'm not really sure I agree with that because I feel like it's just kind of per permutated, permuted, transformed into like a different kind of type of relationship. Like I feel like there are still people that I have that sort of relationship with who I like reply to their tweets or like I, I comment on their Instagram posts and they like it. Like that feels pretty small talky to me. Like that feels like a water cooler type uh, chat. But I think um, with everything being online, um, it's an interesting one because I feel like I am generally someone who's less comfortable in like in person or I'd say like uh, real time um, communication, like even like talking to you, Min, which has been lovely and amazing. There is like an element of stress that, that <laughs> comes with it for me. <laughs> and so like, I've, I think I've always been someone who's who's gravitated towards um, like asynchronous um, com communication where like I, I can I can write it down and then send it to someone in a message or like there's there's some sort of um, mediated form of it um, which my mom was telling me the other day she's like yeah that's just letters like that that's that's not a new thing <laughs> like that like she was like when I was younger I wrote your dad letters and I'm like oh yeah I guess that that makes sense um, but I think with COVID, what's been interesting is that um, I've sort of, I feel like I've actually kind of communicated with more of my friends in a way, um, mainly because everyone's sort of more like available in a way, like to be, to be reached um, through this mediated form of communication. I feel like I've like kind of texted people more. Um, I exist in more group chats now, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it feels in relation to like the essay about friendship where I, I kind of question if it's real or not. I don't know if it feels real or not. I think it does because there's right now in this moment, there's no other alternative. And when, when, like, when there's nothing to compare it to, it makes the case that like whatever communication you have, which is something I've always believed, like whatever form of communicating you're doing is valid. Like it, it, any sort of friendship through any like medium counts. And so I think that's sort of, it's sort of made that idea clearer to me this year. So. Well, I think this is a very intentional reach from Johnny to us. And I thank you for it. And Evan is going to come back and make his announcements. So thank you so much, Johnny, for being in conversation with me and sharing us, you know, your book. Uh, thank you for thank you for doing this, man, and for being so like thoughtful with your questions and for um for yeah, just for all for 
for lending your time and your energy and your friendship. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate it. The pleasure is all mine. You're not not all yours. You, you were both wonderful, and I I enjoyed it very much. And I know I know everybody tuned into too. Um, I'm getting getting emails with thanks already. Um, and uh, of course in the chat. Um, thank you, men, for leading this. And Johnny, uh, a pleasure as always. Um, congratulations on the book. Um, if you don't have it yet, get a copy. Get some for your, get get a copy for yourself. Get get a copy for your friends. Definitely get a copy for your for your enemies as well. Um, and men's prepared, as you can see. Um, get it from Booksmith. Uh, the link's just below the the, vid uh, the video. We do still have signed copies. Um, if you have any questions or problems checking out, just send me an email at uh, events at uh, booksmith.com. Um, thank you all so much for being here and um, hope to see you at, at some of our uh, future events um, uh, uh, online for now, um, in person, hopefully soonish. Um, take care and stay well, everybody. Um, thank you again. Bye. <laughs>